to a sort of the, the rest of its session, which I thought was not right. So it's on uh, automata and complexity, and uh, the first presentation will be on Parik's theorem made simple, I thought, first, but it's actually symbolic. So uh, take it away, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just noticed my web browser's being weird, so let's try and get out of that. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Matthew Haig. Uh, I'm at Royal Holloway University of London, so quite local. And this is joint work with Arthur Jez and Anthony Lin. So I'm going to start off by using the limited time I have by shamelessly promoting the fact that we are looking for new lecturers. So if you're looking for a new academic home, then uh, please consider us. I can, let's go on to the talk. So the talk uh, in abstract is about a kind of symbolic automata. So one of the contributions is we look at the idea of a parametric context-free grammars and an equivalent de definition of push-down systems. So that's like a symbolic um, version of a well-known theory. And then we go on to look at the Parik images of these things. In particular, we show that the Parik image of a symbolic context-free grammar can be encoded as a, as a small existential formula. So the great thing about this is we can actually use it for our favorite SMT-based um, verification techniques. So either you know the whole talk or I'll, the rest of the talk, I'll go through what those things mean. So we are interested in strings, like this one here. So obviously, strings are a ubiquitous data type in computer science. So one way that you might not think of straight away is we can think of these uh, strings as being a trace of a program. So when we are verifying programs, we're generating the strings that are generated by those programs. Also, if we're doing some verification of programs that handle text, then we also have to uh, handle strings. So we might be looking for things like uh, code input injections or code injections, which are about the string inputs. And then finally, this kind of work has found a um, recent application at places like Amazon about access control policies. So I'm not going to spend too long on these, but I'm just going to give, show you quickly what they look like. So here is a push-down system. It's modeling a program, and it's generating a string. And we might want to ask questions like, you know, do we read as many things as we write and things like that? Uh, here is a uh, kind of a bit of JavaScript that handles strings. So this is uh, taking some kind of input from the user, in particular their username, escaping their username to try and avoid anything bad happening, and then using the username as part of some JavaScript. This looks like it's doing good things, but actually it's not. So actually we need some proper verification to actually check that the code injection is not possible. And finally, here's an access policy. This um, allows students to access an exam, but it denies them from accessing everything else. And this kind of um, reject and this kind of matching is done using sort of what look a bit like regular expressions. They're a bit weaker than that, but it's, it's basically string analysis. So if we want to check that our access policy is kind of robust, we, we have to do some string verification. So we need to do string analysis to check whether programs behave well, websites are safe, and so on. OK, but what's the kind of problems with this? So one big problem is uh, undecidability. So I saw context-free languages are useful for modeling programs, but as soon as we have context-free languages, <coughs> things start to get undecidable very quickly. But even in the world, if, if we're just looking at strings, we're not interested in kind of context-freeness, then just being able to concatenate strings together and do transjunctions, much like the HTML escape or the JavaScript escape that we saw before, then things also become undecidable. There are also just other problems about computational difficulty. So even if we're just dealing with nice regular things, then we might end up having to intersect lots of regular automata, and that gets kind of pretty big very quickly. That's an exponential blow up just to intersect them. Uh, one kind of observation is that constraint solvers, um, SMT solvers, are getting much better at strings. That's been a hot topic over the past 10 years. But uh, they've been very good at integers for a long time. So their kind of support is much mature, more mature for numbers than it is for strings. <laughs> so that's how we segue into the Parik image. So what is a Parik image? So I'm going to start off with a definition. So here is a language. So it contains a number of strings, either A, AB, BCB, AAB, or AABBBC. And the Parik image of that is kind of an abstraction of that language in terms of like uh, numbers. So what we're going to do is count how many, for every word in this language, we're going to count how many A's we've got, how many B's, and how many C's. So we can see that the, the word A can be represented as this vector that says there is one A and no B's and no C's. A, B can be uh, represented as one A, one B, and no C's, and so forth. We're just counting the number of uh, each time each letter occurs. One nice property of the Parik image is that it is possible to take a kind of a regular language, in fact, a context-free language, and encode the, the Parik image of that as a small integer linear, linear integer constraint. So we can write a, a short SMT formula that characterizes 
all of the kind of counts available in, the, in that language. So this is really useful because we can use it in our SMT solver. We can use it to abstract context-free languages. So those undecidability issues, they kind of go away. And then furthermore, we can abstract strings using numbers. So we can kind of leverage the kind of mature, kind of quite robust and quite, uh, quite quick uh, numerical support to be able to kind of answer queries about strings much more quickly. The cost of that, of course, is that we're abstracting, so we lose some information. So if we, we're still in the situation where if the result is unsat, then we know the answer is actually unsat. But if uh, our abstracted constraint is satisfiable, is satisfiable, then we actually don't know. It could be sat, it could be unsat. So that means we have to actually grapple with the strings themselves. So here's an example of this. So this is an example taken from a, a paper from FM 2023. So this is a simple kind of string constraint that says it has variables x, y, z that should take string values. And we should be able to kind of assign values to those such that the, the equation at the top holds, so <laughs> z, y, x equals x, x, z. And moreover, x is in a, y has, y has some a's followed by some b's, and z is in b style. So most solvers uh, actually fall over on this and they can't solve it, even though it's quite small. But it's easy to disprove by counting things. So we can, get, we can count the number of b characters. So the first observation is that x has to be all a's, so that can't have any b's, so that doesn't contribute much. But y, which appears on the left-hand side, must have at least one b character, because it's got in the expression a plus b plus. So that means the left-hand side has at least one b, so the right-hand side also has to have at least one b. Since that can't appear in the x variable, it must appear in the z variable. However, the z variable also appears on the other side. So if you think about this, that means that we have to have twice as many b's on the left-hand side as we do on the right-hand side. So this is just, since we are required to have at least one b, this becomes numerically impossible to solve. So a bit of integer reasoning gets rid of this constraint, and we can dispatch it without needing any string solvers. So the way we, we would encode that to an abstraction would, we'd first say, here's a, a kind of abstraction of the variables, of the x, y, z variables. We have a, one for the z a counts the number of a's, in Z, Y A counts the number of A's in Y, and so forth. So we can write, rewrite the equality like this to say the same amount of characters appear on each side. And then we use that kind of short image encoding to do the rest of the formula. So we, we can check that the, the X variables are actually a parity image of the regular language that X has to belong to, and then the same for the Y and the Z. So we can do an encoding like this, throw it at our SMT solver, and it will give us pretty much a, an instant answer on that. OK, what is the drawback of this? So the, one of the main drawbacks is alphabet size. So if we, have, um, for if we just have A, B, and C, it's not too bad. But if we have the full ASCII character set, that's 128 variables for every string we have. That's already feeling a bit funky. In Java, we'll need 16,000 variables. In Unicode, it would just go crazy. And then if we want to do something fancier, like have streams of integers, then we need an infinite number of variables. So that means that uh, we're not going to do very well if we just go naively for this. So string constraint solvers have had to deal with um, large alphabets for a long time, because that's one of the main kind of artifacts of dealing with strings. And there is a standard technique that exists, and that's that of a symbolic automaton. So here's a symbolic automaton. I'm actually going to describe a parametric automaton instead, which has the same ideas, but a little bit extra. So here is going to be a generalized symbolic automaton. It's actually a parametric automaton. This just has two transitions. So this uh, P here is a parameter. It can take any value. So the idea is that if, for an accepting run of this automaton, you first have to pick a value of the parameters, and then you have to try and run the automaton. So this says the, the first character we see has to be something that matches the parameter value we chose. And then every other character we see has to be something different, so something different to that parameter. So this kind of pretty small automaton is actually encoding quite a lot. So if we wanted to do this without a symbolic representation, and without parameters, we would need, I don't know, 128 transitions at the start, and then uh, for every one of those, we'd need 127 other transitions. So that would be quite a big automaton. So using these parametric automata, we can compress the representation quite a lot. So here's an example of what that might accept. Uh, I won't go into that too much. OK, so the kind of first contribution we did was said, well, first of all, let's define the concept of a parametric context-free grammar. Let's be able to use symbolic representations in our context-free languages. 
So we define a context-free grammar and a parametric, and the, also a notion of parametric pushdown systems, and we show they're equivalent. So just as you might expect. So here's an example of parametric context-free grammar. We have uh, the rewrite rules here. So we start from S. We can either rewrite to nothing, or we can rewrite to X, followed by S, followed by Y, where X, must, where X and Y must satisfy this constraint, where they're x is smaller than the parameter and y is bigger than the parameter. So we can write things like this. Has my computer just frozen on me? That is not ideal. Uh, I think it's the image that's frozen. My computer is still running. <laughs> We've got these symbolic uh, extensions. Is it possible to um, carry on using the, the kind of parry image? So what is the parry image of a symbolic automaton? So the difficulty here is we might have a possibly infinite number of characters to, to, to keep track of. So we have one very simple idea, which is instead of counting all the characters, we allow the user to give us the predicates that define the characters we're interested in. So your predicates might be x is equal to a, that's one predicate, or it might be that x is within a range, it's either a to z, or we're only interested in even characters, and so forth. So we ask the user to give us a, a kind of a bunch of predicates, and we, the parry image is how many times we see a character that satisfies that predicate. So our image is like this. We say how many times something satisfies the first one, how many times a character satisfies the second one, and how many times it satisfies the third one. So one example, if we only had one predicate, and that predicate was true, it was true for every character, then the parry image would just count the length of the words. That would be a simple example. OK, so one of the benefits of the parry image is we could construct a small SMT formula that would uh, allow us to kind of characterize that parry image and use it with other constraints. But how about if we do this with a symbolic version? So one naive problem with this is that a, a character A could satisfy this predicate, it could satisfy this predicate, and it could satisfy this one. So Characters don't uniquely satisfy one thing. So this kind of gives us an exponential blow up in that every character is kind of a zero, one vector. It satisfies some predicates, it doesn't satisfy others. Fortunately, we show that you can actually encode this parric image still as a small formula, but we have to use some kind of, kind of funky, kind of fun combinatorics to avoid a naive exponential blow up. But that is, is, is possible. Okay, so we did some experiments to kind of see the usefulness of this approach. So we applied this to do some string constraint solving. So we took, for example, here's the constraint we had before, and we kind of applied this kind of, um, we encoded all of this as symbolic uh, automata, and then we applied our parry image, and then we saw whether the unsatisfiability was still witnessed. So the kind of idea was we took uh, some benchmarks from the SMT competitions, and we also generated some of our own using regular expressions from regexlib. We focused on some hard benchmarks. So by hard, we mean Z3 took more than 10 seconds. The reason we did that is because this is an approximate technique. It won't replace a string solver, but it's quite potentially a, a technique a string solver could use to try and dispatch some cases before getting into the, the meaty string stuff. Have I frozen again? OK, the, the image. So these are the results. So the way to read this, and I don't have too much time to explain it, is that if a line goes high up very quickly, then we're doing very well. If it kind of goes low down, not very well, then it's not doing very well. So you could be, our solver is this red one here with the diamonds on it. And in general, we can see that it does very well. It actually solves things pretty quickly. <coughs> so on paper, on these pictures, we're doing really well, and it's actually quite a useful technique. Uh, the, we also need to mention the fact that this is uh, approximate. So these results, some of them are very quick, but they're not accurate. So on these benchmarks, we weren't very accurate. But on the other two, we were quite accurate. So there's a trade-off of accuracy there. OK, so that's kind of all I wanted to present today. Um, I kind of didn't think I'd have much time for future work, so I was a bit lazy about this slides. But I think in terms of future work, one of the main things would be to integrate this properly into solvers. At the moment, we're just taking the whole constraint and turning it into a image, which is a bit um, bit of a, an axe, it should be a much more focused usage of this would benefit solvers better. And then also to use, to look at other applications because the parry image is applicable to so many different areas of verification. Okay, thank you. So do we have time for questions? Maybe. 
Thanks for the talk. Oh, that's very loud. Um, uh, do you think this could be extended to work with tree languages? Um, I think it, that's a good question. So there's always a connection between context freeness and trees. And I believe um, we've been in contact with someone who has been doing some similar work related to trees. <coughs> so I think there's definitely some, some, something that could be done there. Um, I'm not sure of the exact notions myself. Okay, thanks. Um, may I just also interpose a question? Um, so for the alphabet sizes, the, uh, a common technique is to actually look at the uh, you know, uh, expressions and see actually whether you can partition just by looking at the expressions, the alphabet uh, into you know, basically what would correspond to disjoint predicates. How would that compare or is it applicable to your technique? Of, um, so yeah. I think if you're just dealing with uh, strings and Unicode, there's the, the, um, uh, the kind of the interval representation. And interval representations are nice in that um, you can actually split them down without an exponential blow up. So you could actually use that instead, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but if you want to generalize to kind of more interesting um, data types, so like it's sequences of integers, for example, then uh, that's harder to do. The, the, the predicates could be um, much more general. Then you get this overlap, and you need some tricks to kind of avoid a blow up. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, can you say anything about how the symbolic automata um, affect the closure properties of, uh, of the languages you're considering um, and uh, generating the representing? The uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of work. So um, Marcus Wiener et al. and other people have been investigating symbolic automata and closure properties for a long time. So there are lots of results out there. They generally behave quite well, to my knowledge. Um, I feel like I'll be missing some dangerous case where they don't quite work well by saying that, but they generally behave pretty well. You can do intersection and uh, complement language equivalents, and all of that seems to be generally well behaved. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. So you mentioned you get a small uh, integer formulas. So uh, are there pathological cases where the formulas aren't small? And when you say small, like small in relation to what? Can you expand a bit? Okay, yes, I think I, maybe I deleted them when I was trimming my slides down, but uh, by small we mean polynomially large. So the, in the case of Parik images, the non-symbolic version, the form is actually linear in size. Uh, for us, we go up to n log n, so it's not a huge blow up in that sense. Um, that said, I mean, there's kind of a bunch of stuff that has to go into the encoding, so, I mean, it's a linear blow up, but it does become a bit more complicated, so... When it's talking about pathological cases, we did have to employ some optimizations to stop the solver getting lost looking for representations of minimum spanning trees and things like this. So you have to be careful sometimes. Thank you very much. Oh.